long, long, long ago. I think it was 1994, but it was somewhere around there. It was either 93 or 94, but I think it was 94. I had to interview at Microsoft for a summer intern position when I was still in school. And so what I wanted to do was go over the four questions that they asked me in this, you know, for the programming interview. There were four separate people that I interviewed with, and each one of them asked me a different programming uh, problem. They were given to me in order of difficulty, actually. Uh, I think this was intentional, meaning the first person you interview with gives you the easiest question, and the last person you inter interview with gives you the hardest question, because that definitely is how it worked out, and I think that was intentional. So question number one was a rectangle copy. The definition of this question is if you are given two pointers to two different buffers. So you can imagine something like a uh, care star A star B, where you have two pointers to two different buffers. And you have some information about these buffers. For example, you have like a width of the buffer at the very least, uh, and presumably a height. So you have something like int, you know, width for this buffer. Uh, and they're both, I think, the same. I don't think there were two different widths, but I'm not really sure. Uh, so you have either a width or it might have been a stride. And I don't know which of the two because my memory is kind of hazy. Then the question was, if you are given two rectangles, so for some, you know, something that is your x and y and your width and height for a rectangle, however we want to talk about it, if you have two rectangles, which is basically like a from and a to, how do you write the copy that goes between those two? So just literally you're going to be copying these things. And I believe it was one byte per element in these rectangles, right? So you had a pointer to the first buffer, a pointer to the second buffer. You were going to copy from the from rectangle in A to the to rectangle in B, and you had at least like the stride of the buffers. And, you know, I mean, we could say there were two. I don't know. It doesn't really get any harder regardless of how you structure that. So I don't remember the exact specifics here. Now, this question is very easy. Like, uh, it was so easy that even I got it as, I don't know how old I was at the time, but I was like, you know, 16 or something, and I wasn't a particularly good programmer, and, and I had already even had done things like this, and I knew how to do this, and I did it correctly. So that one was a very easy question, and I imagine it's a pretty easy question still today, I hope. I guess it could be that it isn't because people aren't used to working with things like pointers anymore. Um, or something like that, but it, you know, it, it's a very, very simple question just in general, I would say. Um, so that was question one, and that one I actually got right. Now, with no help, like they obviously will help you work through the problems as part of the interview process. The goal of these interviews was never that you just are supposed to get the right answer anyway. They always say it's just so they can see, you know, do you kind of know what you're doing and, and how do you think through a problem? And can you explain if they ask you questions, right? That's generally how these interviews go. So they didn't really necessarily care that I got it right, but of course it helps. Like if you just get it right, they know you obviously know this thing pretty well. Okay, so number two was actually, in my opinion, sort of simpler, but it was weird because of the way it was asked and the answer that the person seemed to want were kind of strange, and we'll go into that. And this is one where I kind of don't really know if the person really kind of knew their stuff as well as maybe they should have to ask this question. But this question was, very similar to this one, even though it was not coordinated, I don't think, with the other person, but maybe it was. It was, let's assume that you have, again, two pointers, A and B, and this time they point to strings. So these are going to be like, you know, ASCII Z strings, if you will, strings that are null terminated. So they have characters in them, and then at some point there's a zero, and that's just considered the end of the string. That's just, that's just the rule, right? 
And the idea here was implement effectively like stir copy, like implement the thing that would, if you said that, say, B doesn't have anything in it, it's just an empty memory buffer, and A is the string, implement a string copy that copies from A into B, respecting the null terminator. And the thing about this, there's a number of things that are weird about this. Number one is that's not a particularly safe operation to be doing. I mean, at this point, we kind of all know that in general, you don't really want to be, I mean, I hate null terminated strings to begin with, but if you are using null terminated strings, it's very dangerous to be doing things like string copies because you don't really know whether or not this buffer can hold the size of the thing you're passing in. So there's not a lot of checking going on there and it's pretty easy. You know, you can write code that all works correctly doing this, but you have to do a fair bit of planning and make sure that you keep things under control. And there's very little uh, uh, ways that you can uh, uh, guarantee that you don't have errors in that sense. So it's a little bit nerve wracking, but this is what they asked. And I got this one correct as well, although they wanted me to make some modifications to it. And we'll talk about what those are and why I kind of don't really necessarily know if the modifications were great. And if we're feeling particularly motivated, I may try to fire up some compilers from that era to see whether or not the actual changes the person wanted were good ideas. Because I think they may actually have been kind of bad ideas, but it really does depend on what the compiler is going to do. Because when you're writing something like this in a higher level language, especially in that era, if you know your stuff, you know that you probably want to be producing a very specific kind of assembly language uh, output for something like a string copy. And I don't know if this person really knew that. Like, I I'm not sure. So I have questions. I have questions about the person who asked number two. I don't know if you're out there um, still, but I I don't know. I'm 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 a little bit wary of you. Uh, I I wasn't of anyone else, but but in retrospect, I'm a little bit I'm a little bit like I don't know about this guy uh, f for the person who asked this question. Um, at the time, I certainly wasn't. Like I said, just I was just uh, a little kid, didn't really know much about programming, so I, I, I you know, uh, I didn't have any. I just assumed the people who were, you know, knew more than me, uh, and they definitely did probably know more than me at that time as well. So that was actually accurate, even for people who, maybe, uh, in nowadays, I'd be like, uh, really. So anyway. Um, number three was probably the most interesting of the questions. Uh, I think it's a really, really cool thing, uh, especially in retrospect. Like at the time, I think I thought it was cool, but now I think it's really, really cool. So number three is about a flood fill detect. Now, what this was is the person was actually giving me something from experience. This is something that they actually had to do. Like, he had done this. He worked on, I think, uh, one of the versions of, like, Microsoft Basic or something like this, um, or one of those things. Like, uh, I don't really remember exactly what the product was. But this product was supposed to have a flood fill. Now, a flood fill is not a very common operation anymore. In fact, almost nobody does flood fills uh, in the way that this is... The, the, I'm going to describe it, and you're going to be like, huh. They do exist in, like, art packages. Like, in Photoshop, you get the little paint bucket, and you click somewhere, and it fills, you know, out to, like, a boundary. Well, that used to be a function of graphics libraries. Like, you know, nowadays you'd be like, what? Like, that's a function of graphics? It's like, it was. At that time, basic and stuff like that came with the ability to do a flood fill. And a flood fill was exactly what it sounds like. You have some drawing that you've made in like this basic language or whatever. So you've drawn some lines or whatever, or a rectangle. And you want to fill the middle of that with a color. And you want the color to start where you, you know, you're going to give it some coordinates. It's going to go out and it's going to fill the entire block, right, uh, out to the edges. Now, I didn't have, they didn't ask me to implement the entire flood fill because they wanted to talk about something more specific. And what they want to talk about was, in this particular case, the graphics mode was like an old... I'm going to get the names wrong, but I think CGA was the term that it was used at the time to describe this graphics mode. I'm I'm uh, was an, more of an Amiga programmer, uh, so I don't remember like the IBM uh, PC graphics modes as well. But I believe it's CGA. It's four colors. That's how many colors there were. Four. So every pixel was only two bits. 
It was which of the four colors do you want? That's all you get, and nothing else, right? So that meant that each pixel effectively was only two bits. So a byte, like the fundamental unit that the CPU was working with, actually stores four pixels. If you think about the binary, right, if we say that something is eight bits long, then when you look at how it's actually divided up, right, we have one, two, three, four two-bit pieces. So if we just think of this byte as containing four pixels, it means that each of these little two-bit chunks is like a different color. Now the flood fill detect part of this algorithm is what they needed to do, obviously, is when you flood fill an area, the definition for the flood fill is that you fill everywhere that is the same color as the place you're filling. So if the place you're filling, its, its color is two, you're looking for all of the neighboring pixels whose color is also two, and you just keep going and going and going and going until you run out of pixels that match that color. That's what it is. So the most expensive part of this at that time was this, figuring out which pixels matched. And what they had found is the fastest way to do this for them was to take an individual byte like this and first have a quick way to determine whether or not any of the pixels matched in it. Because since the CPU could operate on those eight bits at a time, it could do the check, right, on all four pixels, right, using just, just math on the byte. So the question is, given a particular two-bit pattern, like, you know, we say that the pattern we're matching is one zero. That's the pattern in binary, right? It's, uh, it's, um, what are they, is it OB in, I don't remember what the new, they introduced a notation where you could actually put binary in C, C++ now, but whatever it is, right? I don't know. Pretend it, we know what it is there, but it's one zero in binary. That's not 10, um, uh, decimal. It's one zero in binary. If you have this pattern and you have a byte, so there's something that's like, you know, care unsigned, uh, check, right? We're going to check this thing. Figure out, in the fastest way you can figure out how to do it, if this contains this pattern in any of its four positions. Now, the reason that I thought this was so cool, at the time I think it's pretty cool because it's, it's a neat problem. But nowadays I think it's really cool because this is kind of an example of single instruction multiple data at a time when the CPU didn't really have single instruction multiple data. And so, you know, there's a couple cases that I know of where people were doing this kind of like SIMD without SIMD, where you were trying to use the CPU to do operations on multiple elements that are kind of discrete from each other um, as an optimization. One was David Stafford doing uh, multiple uh, lighting multiplications inside one 32-bit uh, value back in the old days, uh, you know, sort of when MMX was not yet adopted. He did a pretty cool thing where they were doing faster multiplies by multiplying two numbers at the same time instead of one by putting them into one 32-bit value and leaving enough bits for clearance and stuff like that. It's pretty cool stuff. So I thought this was pretty interesting because it's another example of someone basically doing SIMD. They're doing a fast single instruction multiple data kind of path to detect whether or not they have to flood uh, a particular pattern. And I thought that was pretty cool. Um, I should say, I think that's pretty cool now. I thought it was pretty cool then for other reasons. I just thought it was neat uh, that that was a problem, right? So that's problem three. And wait for it. There we go. Problem four was by far the hardest problem. And I'll be completely honest with you. I do not really understand why this is was an interview question. The other three questions make kind of good sense as interview questions. You could argue they're maybe too easy for someone who is not an intern. So they might not make very good questions 
Um, like if you handed me these questions now, I would just kind of be like, wait, seriously? Like, okay, here you go, right? Um, so maybe for a full-time program or a senior dev, they don't really make much sense because they're so easy. But for an intern, I mean, an intern doesn't have any of that experience. So, you know, these are not easy necessarily, at least not when you get to number three. But they are fairly simple, meaning the amount you have to know to be able to solve this is not that uh, uh, vast. You don't have to have a huge baseline of knowledge or anything like that. Number four just seems weird. Like, it's like, I don't understand why this is an interview question. It's kind of weird. Um, at the time, obviously, I thought it was really cool because I learned a lot uh, by thinking about the interview question. But I, I just don't know. Basically, it's just like, uh, draw the outline of a circle. Draw the outline of a circle. Literally. That's what it is. So um, it's a little bit different from some of the other ones. The other ones are like, hey, you have a pointer, right? Or something like that. It was slightly more abstract, but only slightly. It assumes that you have the ability, like, you know, I don't know, we might say given, <laughs> that you have plot x, y. Like, you have the ability to issue an instruction effectively or call a function that will plot a pixel at a particular x, y coordinate. So given that, which you don't have to think about or write, draw the outline of a circle given that you get effectively int uh, x, um, I mean, maybe we'll call them cx for center x, center y, and radius, right? So the circle is supposed to be at this point, centered around this point, and the radius is supposed to be, you know, whatever this was. And again, at that time, no one did anything in floating point. Floating point was just a beautiful dream that people on craze did, right? You didn't use floating point because most computers didn't even have floating point. And by the time they did have floating point, it was too slow for most stuff. So until you got into like 486s, 586s and stuff like that, uh, where people could start to use the x87 part that was actually at speeds that would make it so that you wouldn't just be doing everything in integer if it needed to be fast. Um, so in the 286, 386 era, like you just weren't doing a lot of floating point math. That just wasn't a thing. So the reason you notice these things are all integer is because like, forget it. Like you, you weren't going to be doing floating point math if you were expecting something to run quickly. So those are the four questions that I was asked in my, uh, internship interview. Now that you've seen them all, um, what I would like to do is over the next few days, uh, I'd like to show you how each one is solved in order and then talk about them. And the first one that I'm going to do, obviously I'm going to do them in order because they get harder as they go. Uh, the first one that I'm going to do is the rectangle copy one. The rectangle copy one is obviously, like I said, very easy. So it's a good warm up one. Uh, and we can talk about some things like nowadays rectangle copy would be very different than rectangle copy was back then. And so the fact that this was very easy at the time, well, it becomes a lot more difficult now. So that's the one I'd like to do first. And so what I'm going to do now is because, you know, I, I want to break this up into chunks. I'm just going to end it there so that everyone has seen the questions. And if you would like to work on them first before you see uh, any of my answers, you can go ahead and do that now. Um, and I'm going to get started on this one in the first video, but you'll have a couple days. I'm do these just one at a time. You'll have a couple days to get to the hard ones because, you know, today and tomorrow, I will just do the two more easy ones. And then by the time we get to the end of the week, uh, then you will have to look at number three and number four. So that's everything. And again, all of this stuff will go up on computerenhanced.com. So if you want to grab it, it will be over there. Uh, with transcripts and all that stuff.